another Thanks, nail biter, Mike. knocking off Vanderbilt 22 to 17 to improve to 3 and 0. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Alex Wilcox alongside WHME Sports Director Chuck Freeby. Tim Priester from Irish Illustrated also joins us to break down the action. And Tim, we start at the end of the first. Irish up three, third and 11 from the 13. And for the first time this season, Brandon Wimbush will take off and go into the end zone for a rushing touchdown. Well, it was good to see him back in the running game, which he avoided last week. The problem with that red zone, though, is without a McGlinchey, without a Nelson, without an Adams, they're kind of limited as to what they can do. As to what they can do, we see Ian Book playing more in the red zone, which is kind of funny because Wimbush was one of the greatest red zone quarterbacks in Notre Dame history last year. Well, the whole situation with the quarterbacks in the red zone is very perplexing right now. Very strange, definitely. And how about that block by Michael Young at the end of that, blocking on the corner, really allowing Wimbush to get yeah, in? Yeah, Michael Young has had difficulty getting on the field early this year. Yep. We saw him make an impact in the kick return game as well. Big game for Michael Young today. Now it's one of the wildest plays you'll see. Vandy threatening. Quarterback Kyle Shermer hits Donovan Tennyson inside the five, but at the goal line, Alohi Gilman rips the ball out after multiple bounces and attempted recoveries in the end zone. Julian Love eventually falls on this, and the Irish take over and get the big stop. The thing I loved about that, every member of the secondary played a role there. Pride made the tackle, Gilman pulled it loose, Elliott almost made the fumble recovery, and then Julian Love ended up making a great play in the end zone. Alohi Gilman continues to be a big factor at safety for this team. Yeah, and I, I you know, again, I think Jalen Elliott, he made the last pass break up as well. I, it, it is astonishing, and not so much Gilman because we expected it, but the tandem of Gilman and Elliott are really playing not good football. I think they're playing great football on the back end. Now let's take you to the closing seconds of the third quarter. Vanderbilt knocking on the door, and Keyshawn Vaughn right up the middle from five yards out. Commodores are in the game at 16-10, and they really dominated the third quarter. Well, they did. I think the defense got very tired. I think seven straight trips Vanderbilt got into Notre Dame territory, whereas it took them almost the entire first half to get into Notre Dame territory. Notre Dame's defense got tired. Notre Dame's offense has produced 19 points in the second half in three games, and that's just not enough to put a team away. The Irish, though, would answer on the very next drive Brandon Wimbush with the nice touch pass down the sideline to Tony Jones Jr. He breaks a couple tackles, gets inside the 15-yard line. A 32-yard gain sets the Irish up inside the red zone. And then Ian Book comes in to finish off the drive. He hits Nick Wisher on the rollout for the touchdown. Now they wouldn't get, you'll, you're seeing it right here, Wisher with the nice touchdown grab. They didn't get the two-point conversion, but they extend their lead 22 to 10 with 11 minutes left. I've never liked going for the two-point conversion there because when Justin Yoon lined up for the field goal that he missed at the end, that would have only given them an eight-point lead, whereas kicking the extra point there would have, that would have made it a nine-point lead. You what do you make? Go ahead. You touched on it a little bit. But just what are the Irish doing with their quarterback situation inside the red zone? Well, they obviously have big plans for Ian Book in the red zone. Now, we saw the rollout and throw to Wisher, which is a, which generally is a pass that Wimbush would struggle with. But a lot of the times when Ian Book comes in, it's just a, a straight handoff. But, you know, the, I think the offensive line got really good push early on. They, they had 96 yards rushing in the first quarter. But it really bogged down, uh, you know, after that. And I think that Chip Long is having difficulty finding something that he can sustain because of the inconsistency of Wimbush throwing the football. Derek Mason's Commodores, though, had no quit. Vandy comes right down the field, capped off by Shermer to yet another one of their offensive weapons. Jared Pinkney, the tight end, 18 yards for the score. This Irish lead is just five midway through the fourth. Yeah, you know, two really good receivers in, in, in Pinckney and, and Lipscomb. Lipscomb was pretty much unstoppable until the very end when Jalen Elliott made a great play on him. And now in the closing seconds of the game, or closing minutes, fourth down for Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt looking for the win on fourth down. It looks like he catches it. But Jalen Elliott makes a nice play, knocks the ball out. Call it a, a pass breakup call, just a drop by the Vanderbilt receiver. But Jalen Elliott makes, makes the play. Uh, Vanderbilt turns it over on downs. And the Irish are going to squeak this one out. I really thought Notre Dame would get more consistent pressure on Shermer. Now that offensive line is a veteran line. There are only two opponents this year that have their lines returning intact. 
Wake Forest next week is one of them, although they've had injuries in Vanderbilt as well. But Notre Dame had difficulty getting to him. Um, you know, they I mean, they made plays on the back end, though, when they really had to, and that ultimately sealed the win. And really, isn't that a big change for the Irish yep. to get that kind of play on the back end it, of the It defense? really is. I mean, the cornerbacks are outstanding. Troy Pride was picked on a little bit. He got that tough interference call at the end. But I think you really have to – you look at this team – we thought going in, we said the defense would be the backbone of this team. They, this is now 13 of the last 16 games, dating back to the beginning of last year, that they've given up 20 points or less. The offense is going to continue to struggle. That's just the way it is. But you can pretty much count on that defense to keep them in the game every week. What do you make of Notre Dame, the whole team in general, just their inability, though, to close out games and put teams away? Yeah, I really think most of that falls on the offense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the defense has, I, I don't want to exonerate them completely in this, but the defense has had that series where suddenly they can't tackle and they can't make a play. Now, you can't expect them to, to limit the offense every time, but I really do think they got tired. I, like I said early, uh, seven straight drives where they got in Notre Dame territory. But for it to say 17 points on the board for Vanderbilt, Tells you that the Notre Dame defense did a pretty good, good job today. 22-17, the Irish win it. They're now 3-0 on the year. We appreciate Tim Priester from Irish Illustrated being with us. And you can subscribe to Irish Illustrated, the number one source for Notre Dame sports online. Just head to irishillustrated.com and click on join to find the best plan for you. Now we all know a home game here at the stadium wouldn't be complete, of course, without the band of the Fighting Irish. This season, they are celebrating their 173rd year, despite what Alex would tell you, I've not been around for all of those. <laughs> New Center 16's Jen Cardone spent all afternoon with a band of the Fighting Irish, and Jen, they work just as hard as the team. Oh, you know they don't. Are you sure you haven't been here for hey 173 <laughs> years? Well, you know what? Every single home game, they're out all morning long, pumping up the 80,000-plus fans that make their way out here, keeping both the team and the fans in both in positive spirits. Now, earlier today, I caught up with them on the steps of Bond Hall where they gave everyone a taste of their halftime show. This is something that they do every single week. Now, like we said, it's the 173rd year of the Band of the Fighting Irish. They started three years after Notre Dame was founded, and they're also the oldest band in the country. Every game they're performing before, during, and after the game to keep the spirit of this university alive. Everyone who performs understands just how important their role is in pulling off a successful game. I love entertaining. I love being able to just relate to people on game day, having, you know, mothers come up with their children, just can you take a picture? Our child loves the band, they want to be in the band. There's nothing like it. Just being able to offer fans an experience unlike any other in the nation. It's just, it's wonderful. And many of you may not know this, but you don't have to be a Notre Dame student to be part of the band. They are open to students who attend Holy Cross and St. Mary's College as well. And coming up on New Center 16 at 11, I'm going to take you to their halftime show and when, when, what went beyond or behind this halftime show. They featured the military and Aretha Franklin. They did a little tribute to her. A whole lot more going on uh, on game day just then. The action uh, right on the field behind us. Thanks a lot, Absolutely. Jen. And that'll do it for us at the stadium for right now. Let's go back to the WNDU newsroom for the rest of your news tonight at 6. And I know that Coach Kelly said you and Ian have bought into the kind of quarterback switches when they happen. But just from a pragmatic standpoint, how difficult is that to come in and out? How do you get yourself so that when you come back in, you're back in a rhythm? Uh, I think it's only – what time span? Like two or three plays at most. Um, so, Coach Kelly's right. I think we both bought into it. We're fully bought into it. Whatever, whoever, um, however, you know, to get a, a W, we're gonna do it. So, um, obviously, it worked today. So we're excited. Brandon, I think some people would be surprised when you said you're happy with how the offense executed, just because you know not a ton of points. Um, was that Vandy's defense, or what? What all you think? I think they're they're. They're an SEC defense, and they have uh, personnel that um, is going to match up with a lot of offenses. And um, those guys are on scholarship, too. And uh, they prepare. They practice all week. They watch film. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think we did what we wanted to do. I don't, maybe not execute, but I think we came out and we, um, we fought hard. We started strong. Um, we, we started fast, and, we, and I think we finished strong. So 
Um, that's been an emphasis this week, and I think we did that. Brandon, here in the front, I, I guess regardless of whether it was a maximum performance or, or an improvement, what, how would you just sort of describe the identity of the offense right now, uh, and what do you think the biggest next step is for you guys? Um, I think it's still out there, honestly. Um, I think we're still forming that identity. And Coach Kelly came up to me and said, you know, we wanted to – week three is time where you kind of, you know, form that identity. And I don't think, you know, um, just looking back on these first three weeks, I don't think there's something that we can kind of hang our hat on yet. And um, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's not. But, you know, as we practice more and see who we, we become. So I'm excited for it. Yeah, I guess is that the lack of identity through it. Good, bad, and different, doesn't matter. <sighs> three wins, man. I mean, yeah. I don't care if we have an idea if we can win. <laughs> Brandon, uh, I know you're not the one that threw him the touchdown, but to see Nick Wisher grab that TD, what what can you say about uh, him as a as a leader and how excited maybe the whole sideline was to see that? Every time he catches a ball, you, you see the rest of the sideline get so riled up. I mean, it's awesome to have a fifth year guy who came back and wanted to contribute, um, you know, to more than just winning football games, but to the community and, and such a bigger picture for a wish. And um, we're excited for him. And whenever he gets the ball, it's typically, or whenever he's targeted, he typically catches it and makes a great play, um, like he did today. Welcome back into the sidelines of Notre Dame Stadium. I'm Alex Wilcox alongside WHME Sports Director Chuck Freeby. We just heard from Irish senior quarterback Brandon Wimbush, who just took the podium a couple minutes ago. We gave you a brief snippet of that conversation as the Irish improved to 3-0 and knock off Vanderbilt 22-17 here at the stadium. Chuck, I think the main takeaway from that little piece that we saw from the interview was that even Brandon Wimbush acknowledged that this offense really doesn't have an identity yet. They don't, and as he noted, it's more important that they're 3-0 and mm -hmm. than, than having an offensive identity. But the fact of the matter remains, Chip Lawn is still searching for answers with this Irish offense. And Brandon Wimbush can't really come out and say this, but a lot of that is because of Brandon Wimbush's performance right now. He was 13 of 23 throwing the football today yeah. for 132 yards. He could have very easily had two or three balls picked off today. That didn't happen for Vanderbilt, and that was a big difference in this football game because the Irish didn't turn the football over. And the other thing that Notre Dame hasn't been able to do, as Brandon aptly noted, was establish enough of an offensive identity with other facets of the game. Because people can load up against the run, they're doing that and mm -hmm. taking some of that running game away from the Irish. Now, I thought Tony Jones Jr. ran the ball exceptionally well today, 118 yards on 17 carries. But I was perplexed when Brandon Wimbush said, we're finishing strong. That's not yeah. the Irish team I've seen the last three games. No, definitely not. I, I mean, they're not even finishing drives off strong. And Brandon Wimbush yeah. isn't finishing drives at all, as every time they seemingly get into the red zone, they pull him in favor of Ian Book. I, I don't know how you establish an offensive identity when you're constantly switching quarterbacks as well. Well, and while Brandon said the right things that mm -hmm. they bought in, his body language did not exactly say yeah. that he has bought in on that. So we'll see how that goes. Well, Notre Dame's opponent from last week, Ball State, takes on Indiana in Bloomington. At the beginning of the second quarter, the Hoosiers find the end zone. Steve Scott takes the ball and rushes in for the touchdown as Indiana takes the 10 to three lead. A few minutes later, the Cardinals would punt it away to the Hoosiers, and boy did Jayshon Harris make the Redbirds pay. He makes a man miss, and no one would catch him. Gets down the sideline, 86 yard punt return for Harris, gives Indiana the 17 to three lead. They still weren't done in this one. Ball State uh, really must have left it all on the field here at Notre Dame Stadium. Didn't bring it with them to Bloomington. In the third quarter, Ronnie Walker slices and dices his way across the goal line for the touchdown. Indiana leads 31-10, to and they go on to win 38-10 over Ball State. The Hoosiers are now 3-0 on the season. Let's check in on Notre Dame's next home opponent in two weeks, the ninth-ranked Stanford Cardinal hosting the Aggies of UC Davis in sunny California. We'll pick things up second quarter. Stanford down by three. They weren't playing Bryce Love today. They didn't need him. KJ Costello with JJ Arcega Whiteside in the right corner for the TD. Cardinals take a 7 3 lead. Now we'll skip to the third. Stanford extending their lead. They'll do so again. Cameron Starlet with the carry punches it on in. 
Cardinals led 27-3. UC Davis would grab the final points of the game with a Hail Mary. Hunter Rodriguez finding C.J. Spencer in the end zone. That's a nice moment for them, but Stanford wins it by a count of 30-10. to Elsewhere in college football, the Michigan Wolverines are putting the beat down on SMU. They lead this one 35-13 to 13 in the fourth quarter. Michigan added a, a touchdown than what you see on your scoreboard there. Quarterback Shea Patterson has three touchdown passes, and the Michigan defense returned a Mustang interception for a touchdown. The Boilermakers, meanwhile, are set to play tonight at 7.30 against Purdue. On to some baseball, Tigers and Indians in Cleveland this afternoon, and this got ugly in a hurry. First batter of the game, Francisco Lindor. Thanks for playing our game. Here's your lovely parting gift. He leaves the yard with a solo shot. It's one nothing Tribe. The very next batter, Michael Brantley, and he'll make it back-to-back -back jacks for the Indians. Michael Fulmer and the Tigers not off to a great start, and it didn't get any better in the third. Detroit already down 11. Yonder Alonzo joins in on the fun. That's a two-run poke. 13-0. Indians win it by a count of 15 to nothing. Meanwhile, not as many runs being produced in the Windy City. Chicago leads Cincinnati 1-0 on a Wilson Contreras RBI single to right in the sixth. John Lester having a fantastic game for the Cubbies. Seven innings pitched, nine strikeouts, no earned runs. This game is currently in the ninth inning. And also, I should give you a quick little update on what's going on around college football. Up at Camp Randall, Wisconsin, a top 10 team, is fighting for their lives right now against BYU. The Cougars lead at 24-21 late in the fourth. Wisconsin with the ball and driving, though, trying to rally and get what for them would be a big win. And for BYU, they would have the first major upset of the college football season, although We've nearly seen two right here in our backyard. <laughs> Very true. Maybe uh, Irish fans can feel a little better knowing that they're not the only ones struggling against maybe lesser teams in, in their house. The big story, though, is that the Irish do improve to 3-0. It may have been ugly, but, hey, a win's a win. You'd rather learn from a win than a loss. The Irish are 3-0. They knock off Vanderbilt 22-17. That'll do it for Chuck and I here on the sidelines at Notre Dame Stadium. I'll be back tonight on New Center 16 at 11 with highlights and reaction. Kim? Go run the football. Uh, that's an SEC team. We ran it for, I don't know, 200 and 250 yards. I think that's pretty good. So a lot of, lot of things, a um, lot of positives from it. So with that, I'll open up to uh, questions. Coach, uh, Austin Huff, Goshen News. First off, I'm sorry I missed you on Thursday. I listen, know that was a big I, I'll deal. I'll tell you what, it was a tough uh, tough day on Thursday. I had to listen to Samson and <laughs> all his questions from his new venture in Time Illustrated that he works I, for. I, I apologize. I really didn't mean <laughs> uh, Actual questions now. Uh, Brandon ran a lot more today. Was that part of the game plan? You know, I, I, we keep going through this. Brandon is part of our running game. You know, I mean, we, we want, um, you know, we want to focus on the things that he does well, and, and he runs the football. Um, he also throws it, and he also is a good leader, um, and uh, he's a great competitor. So um, some, some weeks he may run it more than others, but he's one of our really good runners. So um, I think we all should just kind of – get used to the fact that he's going to be part of our running game each and every week. Some weeks he may get more carries than others, but um, he, he's certainly part of it, yes. Does, do you think that gives you an advantage, having a guy who can run the ball, maybe salvage some plays that don't work? Um, yeah, well, certainly. Anytime you have a quarterback that has that ability to extend plays, there's, there's, there's a definite benefit there. But if, he, if, if, if it, the net result is a turnover or poor decisions – no, it's not an advantage. And we saw last week, as you know, that he didn't make good decisions. That's not him. You know, he's not been that sloppy, bad decision kind of guy. He makes good decisions, and we saw that again today. Uh, y you saw the kind of player he is in the two out of the three games that we played, and I think that's much more towards the trend of who he is. Brian, to your right, yeah. is there a way to take some of the comfort in those scripted series that three games in a row have really come out quickly and gotten down the field and apply it to the rest of the game? You know, I was asked that question again earlier in the week. We don't script them. Um, so they're not really scripted plays. Um, we just get into a good flow early on. And, um, 
you know, what we probably need to do is, is be more repeaters uh, of plays. In other words, go back to plays that have been successful and come back and repeat them. Well, one play it seemed you did repeat was that pseudo wheel route to Tony Jones up the sideline. Was there something you saw in Vanderbilt where that really could be applicable? Well, a lot of man coverage. So, you know, we're getting the wheel, drive, dig combination. So if you do a good job, you know, defending him, uh, then we're creating space on the drive route coming back. So they're, they're really easy comp. And you just heard from Irish head coach Brian Kelly after Notre Dame's 22-17 to win over Vanderbilt here at Notre Dame Stadium. From that little snippet we just saw, I spent a lot of time talk talking about Brandon Wimbush as a runner. Uh, rushed for almost 100 yards today. Seems like it may have been more of the game plan today than last week. But he, Kelly wouldn't really go into that as much. He wouldn't admit that that was part of the game plan well and one thing that he said before we were able to put his comments on the air was he'd like to say that this team is a finished product it just isn't right mm -hmm. now and that's an accurate statement and truly i don't think any college football team three games into the season is a finished product yeah so it's easy to get reactionary and i can understand where he's coming from which is hey we're three and oh our job is to win football games and we've done that job and if they continue to do it, there's not going to be that many point people at the end of the year looking at, well, they only won by five or they only won by six because if they go 12-0 and 0 against their schedule, they're going to be in good shape for the playoff. No one's going to be complaining if they're 12-0. and 0. Fact of the matter is, though, the way they're playing right now makes somebody say they're not going to go 12-0. and 0. Right, absolutely. One point, though, while a lot of Irish fans are uh, not feeling so great about a bunch of these wins, Notre Dame's never trailed yet this season. So... They're, they're playing close games, maybe closer than they should, but at the end of the day, Notre Dame's never trailed, and they are still 3-0, and which is exactly where they want to be. Kim? Thanks, guys. Great coverage, as always. And also, as always, the fun started bright and early on this game day. Tailgaters started partying in the lots just outside the stadium at 6 a.m. The Irish faithful, they made their area, the kitchen, the living room, and in some cases, even their bar. After street, three straight home games, those tailgaters can finally take a well-earned break. I'm tired for them, Cindy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the Fighting Irish will take to the road to face the Demon Deacons of Wake Forest next. <laughs> nice, but you know what? All their tailgate food always looks so good. And I was like, oh man, I wish I could be out there, but mm -hmm. alas. Yeah, give me uh, some chicken wings. <laughs> yeah, they had some nice weather today. It was a little on the warm side, but you know, I'm sure that they were just happy it was dry. We'll have another dry day tomorrow as we see mostly sunny skies. Highs in the mid 80s there. We won't see some rain and cooler temperatures till later in the week. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cindy. And we will be back tonight at 11. We hope that you guys join us. Ha, ha, ha. Awesome.